welcome to The Morning Show, your daily wake up at Watches and Wonders. I'm Belle Donati and I'm delighted to have you with us this morning, joining us from all around the world. Grab your coffee and let's find out everything we need to know about the day ahead. Exciting first day yesterday. I hope you were all uh, watching lots of announcements from lots of brands all through the day. If you missed any of them, fear not, that's our job. We're here to the rescue. We've rounded up all those announcements into a bite-sized film for you to watch. Let's start by taking a look at that. Over the past years, our watchmaker and our artisan have worked hard to conceive what will be revealed in this edition of Watches and Wonder. The Minerva chronograph of the past, this 1858 Geosphere, is such a tool watch for today, linking the past and the present through history, complications, and style. As I mentioned, the limited edition 1858 pays tribute to Heinhold's solo trek across the Gobi Desert in 2004. We really try to, to get this inspiration into this, uh, into this watch. In today's world, um, a customer who's looking for a tool watch or a diving watch wants a watch which will go to the edge of the world with him or her, but also something that fits under a shirt uh, for everyday use as well. And ergonomics was really at the heart of uh, a lot of the work we did on this watch. Um, from the front, it's very much an aqua racer. When you turn it to the side, you'll notice that we've changed the angle of the horns, we've made it steeper, uh, we've made them shorter, we've made sure that it fits on a very wide range of wrists, so it's a very comfortable watch to wear. So ergonomics. And ergonomics is not only the case, but also the bracelets and the, the, the clasp. For the seventh year in a row, we are, are presenting to you a world record of tennis. It's a lot and it's the symbol today of our expanding expertise in terms of watchmaking. So what kind of world we called? Well, at some point in our history of ultra slim calibers, we had to address the question of perpetual calendar. There is no complication that describes IWC's watchmaking and engineering philosophy better than the ingenious perpetual calendar especially when combined with a stainless steel 46 mm big pilot case. Well, there you go. You are all up to date on those brand announcements. Uh, time now for us to dive into some of the finer detail on those. To do that, I'm joined by Mimosa Spencer. She is the senior business editor at Women's Wear Daily. Mimosa, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be here. Now listen, I suppose after a year so, in which we have all been trapped inside our own homes, uh, it was inevitable that a travel theme might emerge this year. Exactly. Also, the hard work thing. Um, I'd like to, starting that out with the Vacheron Constantin, the Louis Ferla, who pays homage to the people who are doing the work behind the scenes. Um, but then you see how the brand takes us on a little trip with the, with the nice little picture of maps and ships, a little playful animation. Um, then after the modern animals you know, look away in the past, Explorers. You've got Mont Blanc CEO Nikola Doretsky in a library with the explorer Reinhold Messner, who crossed the Gobi Desert. Now he, they've made a watch that's supposed to evoke this this uh, 
passing of the desert, crossing the desert, uh, it was a trip in 2004. Then we get a little technical with um, Tag and um, you've got the creative director, Guy, Guy Bove, talking about how the brand tweaks certain features on the aqua racer. Um, now, this is quite interesting because he talks about, you know, going to the edge of the world, but then he also brings us back to daily life and says, you know, you need something that fits under your shirt, which is quite a, a good point, I think. Um, and then going into further into the technical details, you've got um, Bulgari watch division head Antoine Pain, who's talking about how the label has broken all these records for thinness, um, which is really interesting because it shows how the brand is, is combining not only style, but also technological prowess. Um, the Octo Finissimo has broken yet another Mimosa, you've, I'm sorry to cut you off. You've also, yeah. you've also noticed a real emphasis on this idea of storytelling as well, haven't you? That's right, that's right. And you can see uh, with um, IWC, these technical details are put into a watch that's related to pilots. So you have to talk, you know, you talk about everything that's linked to pilots. With the aqua racer at TAG, they're talking about the water and pushing your limits. Um, before, the scenes that you didn't see were scenes of surfing. And they had a surfer on there talking about how he looks at his watch and remembers those great waves that he's been surfing. So a lot of it has to do with storytelling and evoking travels and, and uh, certain things like that. I mean, look, the word style, if I say style, mean, will mean very different things to, to, to everyone at home. Um, what sort of different approaches to style have you found in the announcements we've had so far? Well, I thought it was really interesting how um, I, both IWC and Bulgari can focus on a perpetual calendar, um, but at the same time put them into very different watches. One is really focusing on you know, the, the pilot tool side of things, whereas Bulgari is really focusing on the, watch, you know, the style of watches. Uh, the, their piece started out with uh, their CEO, Mr. Baban, in Rome, and you had beautiful visions of the Spanish steps, and you know they're trying to really show that it's that it's linked. The, the watch is highly linked to to the style, the famous Italian style that everyone tries to emulate the world over. Mimosa Spencer, thank you so much for taking us through uh, those brand uh, announcements in such wonderful detail, bringing them to life. Uh, senior business editor there from Women's Aware Daily. Well, it's time now for us to take a view from the top. So what's the news from brand bosses? Uh, well, we're going to hear from them directly. Uh, first of all, we're going to start with Catherine Regnier, uh, Gégard Lecoutes CEO. I spoke to her yesterday. I started by asking her how important corporate or social responsibility is for the brand. Well, I think to understand better Gégard Lecoutes, you really have to know that we were born uh, in 1833 in the Valley de Joux, in the exact same place where the manufacturer still is today. So clearly, our values are based on nature, caring, and also transmission of know-how. Because the manufacturer, the idea behind initially was really to bring artisans in this one place so they could work more efficiently and be even more free to innovate together. Uh, this has been the spirit of Géger Le Coutre, to protect nature, to protect know-how, and to live within the ecosystem of the Vallée de Joux. As an example, sorry, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> just a number we are very proud of, actually. We have reduced our carbon emission by 40% in the last five years. And we've been very involved over the last 12 months, obviously, uh, to support the economy and the local business in the Valley Jou. So it's concrete actions locally that, uh, that really uh, matter to us. And you mentioned earlier that Gégard Le Coutre, of course, is rooted in tradition. How do you nurture the next generation of watchmakers? Well, that's also a very important aspect, of course, of our values. It is the transmission and the protection of know-how. Um, actually, you know that uh, the art of watchmaking uh, has been um, uh, identified by the UNESCO as part of the cultural heritage in the world. So 
really important art of watchmaking. So we protect that by training apprentices. Uh, since 1995, we have over 20 apprentices every year coming to learn watchmaking, micromechanics, or quality, uh, and really uh, mastering uh, all the know-how uh, of the manufacturer. This is a very important aspect of transmitting to the next generation to ensure these know-hows are alive. And when you look at next year, we, we sort of put the, the year that's just been behind yes. us. When you look at next year, what are your ambitions for, for 2021 and 2022? Well, our ambitions are strong. It's a special year for our manufacturer. We are celebrating our icon, the Reverso, that was born in 1931. And I could not resist to bring the best symbol of 2021 for us and this celebration, which I have here. It is our latest Ibris Mechanica, the calibre 185, also called the Quadriptic, because it's actually four sides, sorry, four sides and 11 complications that you can find on this watch. Wow. Here you have a minute repeater, a perpetual calendar, a tourbillon. That's only a few uh, of the marvels uh, of this uh, masterpiece. This is what 2021 is about for us, celebrating our icon and taking watchmaking always a step further. And of course, for us, you've very kindly unveiled uh, essentially a, a brand new model <laughs> yes, for yes. us. Thank you so, so much for bringing ah, it in. We're very happy so to pleasure. see this It will piece. only be made to 10 pieces, so it's really one of a kind. <gasps> oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much for bringing us one of those 10 pieces. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so Catherine much. Vignette, thank, thank you. you. Well, this morning, uh, we're also lucky enough to be hearing uh, from the CEO of H. Moser and Company, Edouard Melan, who uh, joins us from Schaffhausen in northern Switzerland. Uh, now, good morning to you, Mr. Melan. Now, according uh, to the Boston Consulting uh, Group, the, the secondary luxury watch market is now worth almost 16 billion, 16 billion euros per year. Um, how has that informed your decision making process? It's a very important market. I think we, we monitor it now at Moser every day. We look at type of watches, origin, prices, evolution for our, our products. And that has a huge influence on the way we think, the way we take decisions, the way we plan, the way we design. We believe it's important for us to control the value of our products on the long term. Um, we are like investment bankers in a way. That's the, the way we talk about it in, uh, in, the, in the team here and saying we are there to protect the value of the people who have believed and trusting us. And, um, and this way they can, they can, uh, we can make sure the value remains or increase uh, over time. And we believe it's important to have a secondary market because it brings liquidity for people who want to buy something else, want to resell, they want to change, taste change over time. That's important to, to have it out there. What, um, what trends are you most excited about this year? Well, I'm super excited from what, what I've seen yesterday from, uh, from many brands. There's a lot of innovation. I think 2020 was pretty dry. I think uh, a lot of brands have probably uh, been holding up on, uh, on a few novelties. They're releasing uh, what we just saw from JLC is quite amazing. I see a lot of colors. I think it's, uh, that's pretty cool to see all those colors. At Moser, we've been playing with colors for years. So beautiful fumed aisles. Um, I'm also super excited to see more and more of those, we call them beach to tuxedo type of watches, integrated steel bracelet. That's something where we see a lot of brands trying, um, uh, experimenting, innovating, bringing new things to the market. It's a very hype segment, uh, so to say, but it's fun to see all those things coming to the market and see how every brand interprets that segment differently. And of course, this year has been all about this shift uh, to digital. How, to what extent has your loyal following translated into digital followers? I think what's interesting with uh, digitalization is it's, it's the way it brought us much closer to our customers. We used to travel a lot. I mean, 30% of my time was traveling in the past. Last year, I didn't travel, but I feel I, I know the people way more. It allows us to, thanks to technology, to react better, faster to their questions, concern, requests, um, but also we get to, to talk to each other probably more frequently rather than once a year when you're in Japan or in, in Moscow or in New York, whatever. Now we can on a, on a monthly basis address and discuss with certain people and I feel much closer to those people, even some of them I've never met. So I think this is, this is definitely a, a very positive uh, effect and I hope it, it lasts for the long term. Mm. Now, last year you collaborated with the independent brand um, MBNF. How do you approach these sorts of collaborations? Are there any sort of guiding rules, any guiding principles for you? 
I mean, these are some of the most fun projects you can have working with, with other brands, but yeah, it's, there are some rules. I mean, first is what kind of brands do you want to work with? Is there a fit? You need to be careful that there's not too much overlap, that you are complementary. I think that was the case with uh, MBNF. Second, it's the trust. You need to work with people you believe in, that you have confidence in, that you can, you can be very transparent and direct in criticizing or, because at the end of the day, you're trying to create things that you know, one plus one would make more than two. And I think that's based on being constructive to each other and being able to learn from each other. And that was definitely a, a great example. And I'm sure there's going to be many more in the, in the future. Mm, we've, got, uh, we've only got a very short amount of time left, but uh, I've got to ask you the question because you've set some incredibly ambitious uh, goals uh, for yourself, production goals I'm talking about. In a time, of course, where the market is feeling a bit uncertain, how ambitious are you? Very. I think, uh, I mean, we... We feel like we're surfing a wave at Mulder at the moment. Uh, 2020, despite the situation, was an amazing year with strong growth. 2021 is even stronger. We have, as you said, uh, strong ambitions to, to grow the, the brand. I think we have all the parameters in our hand. The big question is more well, the external parameters. You know, a lot of liquidity in the market. Uh, there, is there a, a financial crisis around the corner? These are my concerns, but I think here for us, I think we have amazing products. We have a clear brand, right positioning. We know where we want to go. It's always difficult to find uh, watchmakers here in Schaffhausen, but, uh, but more and more are ready to come here. I think there are two great brands here and, uh, and it's becoming a hub for uh, autology. Oh, we're very excited to hear what's uh, coming from you. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Uh, Edouard Melan, the CEO of H. Moser and Company. Uh, well, for us now, it's time for the watching brief. Now, every day during this segment, we're going to be taking a look at a different aspect, a different angle of the watchmaking process, the watchmaking industry. Today, we're taking a deep dive into transparency. Let's take a look at some of the watches we're going to be taking a look at. A skeletonized movement is considered as a high-flying exercise in the watchmaking universe. The Polo by Piaget, first introduced in 1979, is the house's sporty chic watch. This 42 mm gold model is no exception to this vision with two additional features, the skeletonization of the movement and the elegance of an extra thin caliber. Equipped with a round bezel topping a cushion shaped dial, the watch displays the hour and the minute and the micro rotor can be seen at nine o'clock. The 1200S manufacturer caliber provides a 44-hour power reserve and keeps its promises of slimness with a height of just 2.4 millimeters. The sporty feeling of this 30 meters water-resistant model is enhanced by the contrast between rose gold and the blue PVD treatment, which highlights the perfect finishes of the movement. With this piece, Chanel blur the codes of fine watchmaking and plays with total transparency. Strap, case, dial, and movement bridges are made of sapphire. The bezel features a gold gradient of 58 sapphires. On the dial, 12 baguette cut sapphires indicate the hours with points of color echoing the bezel. The skeletonized caliber 3.1 reinforces this depth effect. With graphic codes borrowed from electroculture, this J12 reinforces the model's iconic status. Since 2016, Hublot has developed extremely advanced skills in machining sapphire. This model is both the purest expression of transparency with its 43 mm diameter case and its integrated bracelet, both made entirely of synthetic sapphire. With its 165 components, the bracelet itself is a technical tour de force. The watch displays on a sapphire dial the hour and the minute, the tourbillon at 6 o'clock, and the 22 carat white gold micro rotor at 12 o'clock. On the movement side, the three bridges of the Caliber Hublot HUB6035, also made of sapphire, reinforce its airy aspect. With a case and bracelet made entirely of sapphire, no more secrets. The movement literally seems to be suspended in the void. Purnell's philosophy can be summed up in one word, the tourbillon, a complication found in all its watches. 
This timepiece features a double triaxial spherical tourbillon. They're called spherion and turn in opposite directions at speeds of 8, 16, and 30 seconds, which is a world first. The outer cage of the two spherions are also set with 152 brilliant cut diamonds. The watch displays hour and minute on a sapphire counter with applied blue baguette sapphires as indexes and blue hands. You can also read the power reserve on the indicator at 9 o'clock. The 48 millimeter case, the three movement bridges, the dial and the top crystal are 100% Swiss made sapphire. With this unique escape too, the house pushes its concept to its extreme limit, providing a maximum of transparency to the watch. True to its image as the enfant terrible of watchmaking, Rebellion Timepieces offers watches with a strong personality. The case of this unique revolt is presented in an electrifying blue-tinted sapphire. The crown has also been machined from a block of sapphire. The manual winding skeleton movement is fixed under the flange extended by geometric bridges and can also be admired from the back. This dial configuration allows a clear view on the regulating organ positioned at 6 o'clock, on the skeletonized hour and minute hands, and on the barrel engraved with the brand name. The cushion-shaped case measures 38.5 by 40.35 millimeters and is water resistant to 30 meters. Rebellion Revolt Sapphire. The Revolt skeletonized model will be issued in three unique pieces, each one in a different color. Skeletonized movements with flying tourbillon are the signature of Roger Dubuis and its hyper horology. This is perfectly embodied in the Excalibur collection and this model in particular. The two skeletonized hour and minute hands evolve around a flange with engraved minute track. This timepiece presents a single flying tourbillon at 7 o'clock. Supported by only one single bridge located below, this tourbillon construction increases the transparency effect. The in-house RD512SQ caliber is certified by the Poinçon de Genève. On this dialless model, with a very aerial structure of star-shaped bridges, transparency is total. The 42 mm diameter Eon Gold case is water resistant to 100 meters. The Maison presents three versions housed in Eon Gold, White Gold, or Dark Grey DLC Titanium cases, each of them limited to 88 pieces. Well, now that we've wet your appetite, let's dive into a bit more detail over those beautiful pieces. Uh, to do that, uh, I'm joined in the studio, first of all, by independent watch consultant Gianfranco Richal. Welcome to you. And look at you with your gloves on. You ready? Yes, yes. I'm really feeling privileged because my 10 fingers has a huge responsibility today. I think a lot of people will be jealous today because I can touch and feel the watches. So Gianfranco is going to be touching those watches on your behalf. And then, of course, we're joined from Munich uh, by Joanna Lange, uh, watch yeah. trainer. Morning to you, Joanna. Good morning, Ben. How are you? I'm very, very well. I hope you're also very well. I'm going to start with a really, really basic question uh, for you. For those people who may not know, what does transparency mean within the watchmaking industry? So, of course, uh, transparency, we're talking about opening up the movement and seeing into the inner beauty of the movement. And in this short video, we saw different ways of how we can do this through skeletonization or through different materials like using the sapphire. And of course, with the use of skeletonization, this was traditionally done on thin movements. So really reducing to the max so that you're removing all the material that's unnecessary from the plates and bridges so that the watch can function perfectly, but we're reducing the weight um, to the maximum. And of course, the wearer of the watch then can really see through the movement and really 
appreciate the skills of the watchmakers and craftsmen that have gone into producing such timepieces. That's brilliant. That, the Polo, what we saw, that very much explains for us. I know that Gianfranco is itching to show us a, a version of this. Gianfranco, <laughs> you've got one in your hand. Janet's truly really an expert. She told everything we have to know about skeleton watches, in fact. And it started from ultra thin watches, which was really the most delicate already, the most uh, difficult to do. And watchmakers began to, to, to express the ability to craft out, to cut out, and it's really well expressed in a movement which is like this Piaget Polo skeletonized with a micro rotor, which allows really to see through the watch. And that's, yeah, like you said, a true expertise which shows how a client or a gentleman can be knowledge in watchmaking. Yeah, it's a, absolutely. A kind of expression of how, how far can you take transparency? Uh, in, in a watch? Are we talking just about the clock face? Where, how far can you take it? That's a mix of different skills, the technical ones, because you have to do the balance between uh, skeletonizing, taking away so much as possible, but it still has to be running and re in a reliable way. And today we want to wear the watch every day, so it has to be really reliable. So that's a, a double skill a watchmaker has to master to achieve it, particularly if you do it on an ultra thin. And uh, then you can also do uh, more recent uh, skeletonizing technique, like uh, typically Roger de B masters with uh, the, this kind of construction, which is not starting from a skeleton movement cutting out, but constructing a building up a movement in a skeletonized way and uh, achieving a kind of design with bridges, which is a more modern way to apply this traditional technique mm. in watchmaking. Joanna, I know you've got some views on that, these sort of different approaches towards uh, transparency, if we're talking sort of modern or, or traditional, how do they differ? Yeah, I think it's a great, I mean, with even these two timepieces, we see the extremes. So the Piaget with the real modern, uh, sorry, the traditional touch, the ultra thin movements, how it was at the beginning when really the watchmakers would sit down and really carve out the material from the bridges. Roger Dubuis taking the completely contemporary modern approach and you see using powerful movements and really forming these star shapes like we see on this Excalibur. So this is the other end of the scale. But I think we also have the Hublot there. I'd love to see that because we see then the transparency through the sapphire. I'm really looking forward to seeing this because it's not only the case, but also the bracelet that we can see not just into the movement, but through the movement from any angle, right, John Tranco? Absolutely. It's not anymore a question of carving out, cutting out, but it's building with transparent materials, which is a third way to do skeletonized or transparent watches, which is more recent as mastering this kind of uh, material, which is uh, after the diamond, one of the hardest material uh, on earth. It means synthetic sapphire. That's one challenge, but the other one, the other one is the, the aesthetical one, because uh, of course you can do sapphire where you cannot really through, see through, and here if you look at it, you see how even the links are designed to avoid any axis, so you can truly see through. I will even say you can see in the movement, not just through the movement like in a traditional skeleton watch, but you can see in the movement and discover what happens inside. So that's the beauty of a mechanical movement seen from, from every side. And, and yeah, it's fascinating, this new way. By the way, uh, Hublot began also with the uh, colored sapphire a few years ago. And this novelty here is a completely transparent one. And uh, we saw in the video before also a colored one from uh, Rebellion, which also launched colored um, uh, sapphire cases. And uh, that's a new trend which is growing and growing today. Mm, but there is another one, right? Uh, uh, Jonna, we were talking yesterday about the, even the transparency to even enhance the beauty of a, of a complication, like the, the tourbillon, the, the, the yeah, pernel, it's, right? It's really exciting. Yeah, that's, that's correct, because we saw also the, the Parnell. So even with a higher complication, we have these like two beating hearts almost outside of the movement that we saw on the, the double triaxial tourbillons all rotating at different speeds. And this is mesmerizing. You know, when you're wearing a piece like this or any of these transparent pieces, it's saying a lot about you as a connoisseur because you're really appreciating the 
art of beauty from the watchmaker. Oh my gosh, the two of you have, have taken us into that world entirely and I am itching to get a closer look at all of those three watches. Joanna Lange in Munich, Gianfranco Richel here with us in the studio. Thank you so much for taking us through those transparent uh, watches. We now are going behind the clock face. Today, we are focusing on partnerships, uh, innovative partnerships, partnerships that focus on corporate social responsibility. We're going to begin uh, by hearing from Ulysse Nardin and their efforts uh, to release, uh, to reduce rather, plastic pollution in our oceans. Well, from aquatic to heritage, we're now going to take a look at how Oris uh, is protecting a very special UNESCO World Heritage Site. Well, I hope that has inspired you. Uh, we are now going to take a look ahead at today's panel. Well, every day, as you know, the Fondation is going to be hosting a panel discussion. It starts this afternoon. We here on The Morning Show will be giving you a glimpse into what those discussions are going to be about uh, with Pascal Ravissou all, uh, all week. Welcome to you, Pascal. Um Glad to be here again. It is the Corporate Re Social Responsibility Day today, isn't it? It is indeed. It's a very uh, pressing issue, as you know, the CSR, and it's an issue that is rightfully becoming central for all kind of businesses and for all the customer concerns and certainly for our industry as well. Uh, in terms of the, the topics, the kind of main themes that are going to be teased out during this, uh, this panel, do you have an idea of that? Yes, well, actually, we could, we could discuss CSR uh, for a panel every day for the whole year, but basically the idea is to stay quite general. Uh, and for our panelists that will join from our industry, is uh, we, we want to hear uh, from their vision and their overall strategy and why and how they change the way they do business in order uh, you know, to tackle this, this issue. But first, we will show, uh, well, try to show why uh, CSR is so important for the planet for our species, for mankind in general, and certainly for our customers. And we will also try to have a benchmark. So where are we on the CSR scale, uh, watchmaking versus other luxury industries, for instance? Oh, that's fascinating. Why do you think it is so important for the watchmaking industry to take this focus now on corporate social responsibility? I think it's 
I mean, we have no choice. Uh, the planet is in emergency mode and it's been for quite a while. It took some time for the whole world to kind of grasp uh, the, the magnitude of the problem. Mm. So, of course, watchmaking is included in this and, and we have to act together. Mm -hmm. and who are we going to have on today's panel to talk us through those subjects? So, first and foremost, we have Mike Horn, the famous explorer and adventurer. As you know, uh, exploration is, a, is quite a team. And uh, who best to, uh, you know, to, to understand where we are in terms of uh, planet emergency. Then uh, from Milano, we have uh, Jean-Marc Pontrouet, the CEO of Panerai, who will uh, take us through his three pillar approach. We'll uh, have on this set, around this very table, Karl Friedrich uh, Schoeffele, the co-CEO of Chopard, uh, and we'll see uh, his view as a CSR pioneer. We also have uh, Sasha Murray, the CEO of Karl F. Bucher, and, and his uh, way to really protect biodiversity and create luxury with a purpose. And uh, we'll also have an external expert, uh, Céline Dassonville, the co-founder of Etiwork, who will actually take us through where we are and, and uh, are we really the good, uh, the good guys or where are we in terms of uh, you know, balancing uh, the interest of the industry towards other industries. Brilliant. Well, I hope you are all going to be extremely excited to watch that. That's going to be available, of course, at B2B and then available on uh, on replay. So do make sure you look out for that. Pascal, thank you very much for talking us through uh, corporate social responsibility today on the panel with a special emphasis on the environment and uh, ecology, of course. Well, I'm afraid that's it from us uh, for this morning. I wish we had more time uh, together, but we will be back tomorrow morning. I hope you've enjoyed the roundup of the day ahead uh, and that you'll join us tomorrow for more. Bye now.